Today we're going to finish chapter 6 on confidence intervals. We're still talking about the confidence intervals, so very similar to what we did in chapter 6.1. The difference this time is our standard deviation is unknown. So the definition says when this population standard deviation is unknown, the sample size is less than 30, or the random variable is not approximately normally distributed. So this is exactly the opposite of what we did in section 6.1. So then if sample size is less than 30 and 6.1, it was greater than or equal to 30. It was also approximately normally distributed. So now it is not approximately normally distributed. Then it's going to follow what we call a T distribution. T distribution has the following formula. And I'm going to caution you right now that if you are using your, your calculator, which you need to be, then be very careful when you do use your calculator. We need to make sure that we use parentheses. Parentheses need to be in the top and the bottom. So my formula in my calculator is going to look like x bar minus mu, both in parentheses, divided by parentheses again on the denominator, s divided by the square root of n. So again, this whole set of parentheses needs to be on the entire numerator and then a different set of parentheses on the entire denominator. So be very careful when you use that calculator. Practice, practice, practice. Okay. We're going to look for critical values, and they're denoted by T sub C. Remember when we did last section, 6.1, we did Z sub C. Now we're going to look at T sub Z. Some properties of the T distribution, and again, you don't have to memorize this, but at least it's just information. The mean median mode is equal to zero. The distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric about the mean. The total area is one, so it is going to look very similar to your standard normal distribution, and it does, where the tails are a little thicker or a little higher up. The standard deviation of the t-distribution varies but the sample, with the sample size, but it's always greater than 1, which is good. One of the things we're going to have to determine is what the degrees of freedom are. And the degrees of freedom just tells you, again, that you're trying to remember, take this sample statistic and apply it to the population. And so in order to do that, we need to use what's called the degrees of freedom, which is very simple to find. That's n minus 1. So very simple formula to find. And as the degrees of freedom increase, the graph does look closer and closer to a standard normal. So if your degrees of freedom is only 2, that's this solid black line. Okay. And remembering that the blue is your standard normal, so it's not quite the same if we're looking at the purple line, a degree of freedom of 5, so it's going to get closer and closer as the degrees of freedom increase. So you can see that it's getting closer to the standard normal curve. It's getting closer to that, which is good because that's what we want. So if our degrees of freedom get higher, and remember that once n is greater than or equal to 30, then we are going to be able to use the standard normal in many cases. So if our degrees of freedom, if n is less than 30, so say n is equal to 29, then our degrees of freedom would be 28, which is a very high number. And as it gets larger and larger, remember we're going to get closer and closer to the standard normal. Right. Again, we're going to try to find these critical values. And in order to do that, we need a chart in the book. This cannot be done on your calculator. So we need a chart either from the book or from what I've given you in, in your class. There's a copy of the T-distribution. 
So yours is in D2L. In order to do this, we're going to look at what the confidence interval we're trying to find. In this case, that's 95% or 0 0.95. The sample size is 15, so n is equal to 15. We need the degrees of freedom, which would be 15 minus 1 or 14. Then I'm going to go to the chart in the book. So the chart in your book looks similar to this. It's going to tell me my degrees of freedom, which are right here, the degrees of freedom. <clears throat> and if we look through the degrees of freedom on the top, it shows the level of confidence. So we're looking at a 95% confidence. Then we're also looking for where N is 14 in this case. So N is 14, and we're going to scroll to 95%. So here is your 95%. Here is your N equals 14. And I know my pen is not writing on this chart, but it would be right at the 2.145. 2.145. Again, practice using these charts. So it says my critical value my T sub C is equal to 2.145. It is an approximate value. So again, look at your chart. There is one in your book if you have a copy of your textbook. If not, there's one in D2L. Once you find that critical value, then we're going to find E, very much like we found E before, so that we can build this confidence interval. So again, this is the confidence interval, very similar to what we had before. The difference now is my E value is found using the T sub C, rather than the Z sub C. Okay. But the formulas are very, very similar. And that's important because it should be make, make this a little easier for you when you get ready to find the confidence interval. So our problem then says we randomly select 16 coffee shops and we measure the temperature of the coffee sold at each. The sample mean, so the mean temperature of the 16 coffee shops is 162.0 Fahrenheit. It also has a standard deviation of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It's asking us to construct a 95% confidence interval for the population mean temperature of the coffee sold. So again, we're going to look at 16 shops and see if we can't make a prediction about what the population mean would be. And we are going to assume that they are normally distributed. But because my N is less than 50, 30, we have to use a T distribution. And that is because n is equal to 16 and therefore n is less than 30. So that's why we have to use the t distribution. Okay. So what do we need? We're going to need very much like we did in the last section we're going to need my X bar. We're going to need my standard deviation. We are going to need the confidence interval. We're going to need the degrees of freedom this time. We're going to need my T sub C. Remember, this is the one that's going to come from the chart. And then I'm going to have to find E using the formula T sub C times S divided by the square root of N. Okay. So looking back at my problem, my X bar, that's my mean, this is your sample mean, and in this case the sample mean is equal to 162. The standard deviation the S is equal to 10 degrees. 
My confidence interval that I'm trying to create is 0.95. My degrees of freedom would be 16 minus 1 or 15. And again, from the chart, now I'm looking at degrees of freedom of 15. And again, I know my pen won't work, but you'll have to follow along. So the degree of freedom is 15 this time. I'm still at a 95% confidence interval. So that's going to make it at 2.131. 15 and the 2.131. So from the chart, my critical value is equal to 2.131. So next thing I want to do is find E. E is going to equal my critical value, 2.131, times S, which is my standard deviation, divided by the square root of N, which is 16. Again, careful when using the calculator. My E is going to be approximately equal to 5.3. This is degrees, but 5.3. Try this on your calculator. If you're not getting 5.3, then check again and see what you've typed in and make sure you're using parentheses correctly. Okay. Then we're going to build the confidence interval. And that is the formula, again, x bar minus e is less than mu, which is less than the x bar plus e. So my x bar was 162. We're going to subtract 5.3, and we're going to add 5.3. Subtract and add. If I do that, then my mu is equal to, or sandwiched between my mu, my population, remember this is your population mean, is between 156.7 degrees and 167.3 degrees. And that's your confidence interval. What does that mean in words? What's the interpretation? It says, with 95% confidence, you can say the population mean mean, and again, this is a temperature, of coffee is between 156.7 degrees Fahrenheit and 167.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So you are pretty confident, 95% confident, that the temperature of all coffee so the mean temperature of all coffee is between 156 and 167.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's huge if we can make that assumption just based on 16 coffee houses. So that's a big assumption, but that's how we can do it so we can get additional information that does apply to the entire population. So this one I want you to try on your own. Again, you're going to try to find your, your T sub C, your E, and the confidence interval. I'm going to help you set it up by asking you what you need. What you're going to need, same as the problem before, you're going to need X bar or your, your um, sample mean. You're going to need your sample standard deviation. You're going to need your confidence interval. You're going to need your n so that you can find your degrees of freedom then you're going to find your t sub c remember this is from your chart so look on your chart and then 
you're going to find E by using the formula T sub C equals S over the square root of N. And then you're going to find the confidence interval. And that's going to be your x bar minus e and x bar plus e. And if you read the problem, it says you randomly select 36 cars um, on the same thing so from the same dealership. The sample mean is 975 days, and the standard sample standard deviation is 2.39 this time you're going to do a 99 percent confidence interval for the population uh, for the number of days now you may be asking why is n greater than 30 and again that's because we don't know that what the the um oops we don't know what the population standard deviation is we only know, so this is the population standard deviation, which is unknown. All we know is the sample standard deviation. And that's what this is, is the sample standard deviation. Okay, We don't know whether it's normally distributed. We don't know anything else. It's not telling us anything else about it being normally distributed. So we have to assume then that it is a T distribution. Once you have find all, found all of the items, then I'm get, again, I'm going to ask you to do the interpretation of that so that we know that you are understanding what that means. Okay. So try that one on your own and turn it in with your notes. All right, last thing we're going to cover then is when we use a normal distribution or a T distribution. So following up on what we did just above. All right, how do I know if it's a T distribution or a normal distribution? So let's read this question. It says you randomly select 25 newly constructed homes. So that's going to tell me that N is equal to 25, which is not greater than or equal to 30. That's important. Okay. The sample mean construction, the sample construction is 181,000. And then look right here. Population standard deviation is 28. So in the problem before this, we had the sample standard deviation. And that's what led us to the T distribution. This time it tells us that we have a population standard deviation. And so the population standard deviation is going to be the uh, 28,000. Okay. The sample mean is still your X bar, and that's going to be $181,000. Okay. Assuming construction costs are normally distributed, so are normally distributed. So we do know that we have things that are normally distributed. Then it says which one do we want to use, All right? So first question to ask, is the population normally distributed or is n greater than or equal to 30? Well, we already decided that n was not greater than or equal to 30. So this does not count. But because we know the population is normally distributed, the answer to this question would be yes. So the answer is yes. If we didn't know it was normally distributed, then you can't use either. You can't use the standard or the t-distribution. You cannot use either. The next thing to ask is, is our population standard deviation known? Yes or not? Yes or no? Is the population standard deviation known? And the answer to that in this case is yes, because we know it's a population, so it's a yes. Therefore, we can use the standard normal, 
with a Z sub C score. Okay. So let's just, using this example, let's play on it a little bit more. So what if N was still equal to 25, but we do not know if it is normally distributed. Okay. So n is not greater than or equal to 30, and it is not normally distributed. So that would take us down this path, and the answer would be we, can, we cannot use either. So I have to use neither of these. So neither T nor standard normal. Okay. Let's look at one more. What if N is equal to 35, but we don't know if the sample is normally distributed. Okay, we're not sure. So this one we're going to do in yellow. So this is going to be in yellow. So n is greater than is greater than 30. So that's this. This is true. Okay? We don't care whether or not it's normally distributed, but this is true. Okay? So then we're going to say yes to this. Then it goes back to, is that known? In this case, yes, it is. So yes, n is greater than or equal to 30. So that's good. And yes, my population standard deviation is known. So this time again, we're going to use my Z sub C. Okay. Then the last one we'll look at, if N is equal to, let's say 18. Okay. But, normally distributed is known. Right. So n is equal to, 5 to 18, but we do know that it is normally distributed. So it is normally distributed. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to use a green highlighter. So this time, n is less than or equal to 30, but the population is normally distributed. So again, that's a yes. Is sigma known, yes or no? Well, in this case, if we go back, we, that we say that um, the population is known. So that's a yes. And if it is known and it's a yes, then we're going to go down here and we're going to be back to using the C. So we're going to use the Z sub C. Okay. If, if my N is equal to 18, but instead of the population standard deviation being known, my sample standard deviation is known, then we're going to use the T sub C. 
So a lot of what's riding on here is two things, the size of your population and whether sigma is known or unknown. So if the population standard deviation is known or unknown. So read the question carefully so that you know which one to pick. And that is going to wrap up our chapter six.